Good evening, everybody. I just wanted to welcome everyone to Building Palestine Solidarity After the Bowman Affair. My name is Ashley Smith. I'm part of the Spectre Project, and I'm pinch hitting for Tithi Bhattacharya, who unfortunately had a last minute conflict and couldn't join us for this evening. For those of you who don't know anything about Spectre Journal, it is a journal of insurgent Marxism that sees social and class struggle as the vehicle for social change, especially struggles like the recent uh, Palestinian uni unity intifada that swept um, historic Palestine in, in the uh, during and in the wake of the attacks on Gaza this summer and rebellions like Black Lives Matter and things like the Red State Teachers Revolt and the strikes by unions like Chicago, the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, I first want to thank uh, uh, um, uh, Haymarket Books for putting on this event in collaboration with Spectre Journal. We have a wonderful panel this evening that I'll introduce in just a moment. But first, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to a special offer that Spectre Journal is running in the run up to the val Valentine's Day. We're offering 25% off uh, subscriptions, all subscriptions for everybody uh, who subscribes, no matter how they subscribe, digital or in print. And I encourage everybody to take advantage of that discount subscription offer. Show, show Spectre a little love on Valentine's Day. So from now till Valentine's Day, you can get that discount offer. Um, now let's turn to the panel. First, before I introduce the speakers, I wanted to contextualize uh, the, the panel itself because last summer we saw um, yet another horrific war raged by is waged by Israel against Palestine. Um, and at the same time, we witnessed the magnificent unity intifada that rose up in opposition to that war. And that uprising of Palestinians um, echoed around the world and evoked solidarity demonstrations in mass numbers, especially in London, but also throughout the world, including here in the United States. And in reaction to that, there's been a bipartisan political backlash by the establishment against the Palestine solidarity movement and against the movement for boycott, divestment and sanctions against the state of Israel um, in particular. So across, their country, across the country, are there are dozens of states and cities that are passing legislation, criminalizing and banning the right of BDS in, in those areas. Um, and the, so we're, we're in this fight now um, about where we go next with the Palestine Solidarity Movement. And one of the big things that this bipartisan backlash is using is absolutely unwarranted and illegitimate charges of anti-Semitism against Palestinian activists and Palestine Solidarity activists. So it's within that context that we had the progressives and uh, democratic socialists who have elected office at a federal level about what they would do amidst this uprising, the Israeli war, and the backlash against BDS um, when legislation came uh, uh, before them in, in the form of the military aid to Israel and the funding for Iron Dome, a total of $5 billion package in military weaponry to enforce the ongoing occupation of Palestine. Sadly, many, if not most progressives, failed the test of that. And I think in dramatic form, Jamal Bowman um, violated the, the solidarity with the Palestinian people by voting for military aid um, to, to the state of Israel and distancing himself from the entire BDS movement. And that has provoked an enormous debate on the left and in the Democratic Socialists of America about um, elected leaders, um, uh, solidarity with Palestine, principled uh, positions, strategic positions, um, et cetera. And there's an enormous debate now going on within DSA and in the entire left about how to stand firm to principles and advance the project, both through governmental legislation and um, through activism of Palestine so solidarity. And there's an enormous resistance to the decision of the leadership of DSA not to expel and not even to discipline Jamal Bowman for his votes for military aid to is Israel. Um, and so our panel is gonna be talking tonight about 
that development within DSA, but also the challenges to the broader Palestine solidarity movement. And the goal of the panel is to talk about how we build from the, the enormous debate that's gone on to strengthen the solidarity with the Palestinian liberation struggle. So we have a wonderful set of speakers who are going to be addressing these questions this evening. And I'll introduce them and then turn it over to them in turn. First, we're going to have Haley Pesson. Um, Haley is a socialist activist based in New York. She is a rank and file member of 1199 SEIU, the DSA Afro Socialist Caucus, and the Tempest Collective. After Haley, Brian Bean will speak. They are a Chicago-based socialist, one of the founding editors of Rampant Magazine, a member of the Tempest Collective. They are the co-editor and contributor to Palestine, a socialist introduction, and their writing has appeared in Jacobin, Spectre Journal, Red Flag, International Viewpoint, New Politics, and others. And for people who want to read what Brian writes, there's a brilliant article that he penned along with Shireen Akram Boshar in the most recent print issue of um, Spectre Journal. And finally, um, we'll have Rabab Abdulhadi. She is the founding director and senior scholar of the Arab and Muslim uh, ethnicities and diaspora studies at San Francisco State University. She is a longtime community organizer focused on the struggle for Palestinian liberation and the indivisibility of anti-colonial and anti-racist movements. So I'll turn it over to our panel of speakers, starting with Haley. Take it away, Haley. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Haley. Um, as Ashley said, I'm with uh, the Tempest Collective, the Afro Socialist Caucus, um, and I'm based in New York. So um, before we talk about Bowman and DSA, I actually want to go back even further and start with a little bit of the wider context that Ashley began to lay out. Um, so if we look back to 2020 on May 30th, five days after protests and rebellion erupted across the U.S. in response to the police killing of George Floyd, an Israeli police force in the West Bank killed Ayad Halak, who was a 32-year-old autistic Palestinian man who was unarmed after they attempted to stop him at a checkpoint in Jerusalem. And this led to protests all over Palestine. People took to the streets and they were actually chanting Palestinian lives matter as a symbol of solidarity uh, of, between the Palestinian and black resistance in both places to police violence and racism. In fact, there's a mural um, on the apartheid wall in the West Bank that depicts both George Floyd and Iyad Halak, uh, again, as a symbol of the solidarity between these movements. And this parallel isn't just a, a symbolic parallel, it's actually something based in a material fact. In fact, police in Minneapolis, where George Floyd was killed, had several years earlier joined the ranks of hundreds of police departments around the country, from Chicago to Baltimore to New York, who have participated in shared trainings with Israel's military trained police forces, often funded by taxpayer money. And the point of highlighting this is not to say that U.S. police merely adopted these strategies from Israeli police. Obviously, American police have their roots in slave patrols and strike breakers in the U.S. They're plenty racist enough on their own. But the point is to underscore how capitalist states reinforce each other's ability to violently control populations and enforce racial hierarch hierarchies within their own context. The same could be said of the... Uh, uh, parallels between the U.S. border wall and um, the border wall with Mexico and um, the wall in the West Bank, uh, because there's literally companies that are profiting off of the shared um, militarization and shared surveillance of these communities, whether they be indigenous or whether they be um, immigrant communities, um, in order to better uh, be able to control their movements um, and determine when they cannot move. So these parallels have not been lost on anti-racist activists in the US. Uh, in fact, many people will probably know going back to Ferguson in 2014, one of the first groups of people that actually responded to the rebellion against uh, the racist police killing of Michael Brown was Palestinians on Twitter giving advice to people um, in 
uh, Ferguson about how to resist the military occupation um, of tear gas and of weapons that were raining down on them from militarized U.S. police forces. Um, Later, Black Lives Matter um, and the Movement for Black Lives declared their support for the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement and solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. And last spring, um, as Israeli settlers attempted to violently expel Palestinians from their homes in Sheikh Jarrah, uh, protests erupted around the country and you could uh, actually find mainstream commentators attributing the Black Lives Matter protests of the previous year for the enormous response. And so these, um, this growing support, this break in what has been a um, you know, unconditional support for Israel in the US, I think can be much more attributed to these mass movements. And the reason I raise all of this context, how does this relate to the Bowman affair, is because in addition to this history of solidarity, which actually goes much further back, putting back to the Black Panthers and SNCC um, in support of Palestine, uh, there is this perception that the way we've shifted public opinion has really only been in the last few years due to the presence of progressive and self-described socialist politicians in office um, who are you know, perceived to be or who have rhetorical sympathy with the struggle for Palestine. In reality, I would argue that it has been this mass sea chain that has either led to the fact that these politicians have had to say anything at all in the first place. Um, and it's also been the resistance of Palestinians themselves every time Israel has bombarded Gaza um, with bombs and drones, funded by um, U.S. Uh, taxpayers, funded by um, the both parties of the U.S. Um, that has actually been the context in which this support has grown. And so that is the real threat, is that people will actually take BDS seriously, will actually put um, boycott, divestment, sanctions into action um, wherever they are. Um, and it's why this question around Bowman was so significant. In fact, it was so important that um, activists within DSA tried to uphold their own stated position, which is it back to in 2017, DSA passed a resolution at its convention, the highest decision making body of the organization, saying that it was in support of BDS boycott divestment sanctions. Um, and so when Bowman, who is actually a member of DSA, voted for four billion dollars to um, fund apartheid and genocide, because that's what it is. Um, uh, funding the ability of the Israeli military to do what it has done um, and to uh, continue its project of displacing Palestinians um, by force and um, by controlling their movement um, and even by death. Um, that is what that represents. And so that and the propaganda trip that he took with J Street, which is a liberal Zionist organization, which tries to sugarcoat all of this and give it a softer, less obviously racist veneer, um, was effectively crossing the BDS picket line. And so it was so important that activists in DSA tried to say, you're a member of DSA and we need to hold you accountable. You can't be a member um, and there's no real point to you being in office if you are going to then actually go against what our stated principles are and actually hurt another section of the working class, um, whether they are here or abroad. Um, the fact that the National Political Committee um, was unwilling to hear this, and it was a groundswell of support, not just from the BDS working group, but from the Afro-Socialist Caucus, of which I'm a member, um, the Muslim Caucus, but also groups um, outside of DSA, the um, Young uh, Palestinian Movement and National Students for Justice in Palestine and a number of others calling on DSA to do the right thing and say that there should actually be consequences for doing this in practice, the NPC chose not to do so and chose political expediency um, and proximity to the socialists in office um, rather than actually pushing them and saying that we should hold these people accountable. But I think it's even more than accountability. It's a question of power. Do you see power as being the people who are in those positions in office and being able to say, hey, we've got these people who call themselves socialists in office, or does it matter what they do? And as I said, what Bowman did in practice did not help the socialist movement. It was something that in practice actively harmed Palestinians and also brings uh, DSA's credibility into question. And so the fact that there's continued to be um, pushback even 
since this um, Bowman affair took place, where people are trying to figure out how do we continue to build um, solidarity with Palestine in practice is really significant. It's opened this question wide open. So um, I'm going to uh, move on just to talk about um, what I think needs to happen from here, because there is this potential. It matters that 52 uh, chapters and YDSA chapters opposed um, the position of the National Political Committee, but it also matters that there are now these stronger connections between grassroots groups who've been supporting Palestine for years and groups within and outside of DSA. So to me, the fact that there has been this massive sea change in public opinion really shows the potential, but it's not organized yet. And that should really be our focus. How do we actually organize where we are, whether it's on campuses, whether it's in workplaces, whether it's in communities, whether it's in joint campaigns, educational um, and um, direct action campaigns? How do we actually raise the stakes so that we actually have a movement that is able to convince not just Bowman in a backdoor meeting or one on one trying to kind of politely ask him to respect Palestinian humanity, but actually says we are so powerful powerful that people even to the right of Bowman have to listen to us. That's the kind of movement that is actually going to take, um, not, you know, convincing people little by little, one by one, but actually organizing those forces that are in fact already in sympathy with Palestine and continuing to struggle. Because as we saw, the strategy that works, the reason that we see the sympathy for Palestinians we have now has been through Palestinians' own resistance and through the activism that activists have done in this country over the years. It's called, called awareness to the issue. And it's also called awareness to the perils because this isn't just a question of an important moral struggle um, that we should be in solidarity with. It's also because of the reasons that I began with. There are direct connections between the way that the U.S., um, outsources oppression between imperialism, uh, which I know that Brian's going to talk more about. And if we weaken um, the ability of uh, the U.S. to support those things in Palestine by defunding Israel, by defunding the police here, um, then we actually strengthen all of our movements um, wherever they are. So I'll end there. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Haley. Now I'll turn it over to Brian. Brian, go ahead. Yeah, Haley started by talking about the rebellion um, around George Floyd. And I think it's important to note how the struggles continue and how the people in Minneapolis are on the streets just these days about the killing of Amir Locke. And so both in Palestine and here, um, you know, the attempts by uh, the state and the ruling class to repress and pacify um, don't work. And so I think that the struggle continues. And, you know, we have these 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 discussions in that context. Um, and so then talking about building solidarity with Palestine after the Bowman affair and assessing the current moment, um, I want to kind of hit upon some of the stuff that Haley said and, and um, I think go in a little bit more depth on some certain parts of it. Um, I think it's important to ask uh, sort of the following question in framing the whole thing. So why is it that less than six months after the events of last May's Unity Intifada, when Palestinian resistance to forcible displacement in Sheikh Jarrah and occupied Jerusalem provoked both a murderous bombing campaign of Gaza by the IDF, uh, murdering over 200 Palestinian civilians, leveling apartment buildings, schools, healthcare facilities, um, at the same time when Palestinians all across historic Palestine, not just occupied territories, rose up in rebellion and we saw the first general strike across historic Palestine since probably the first intifada. We saw demonstrations in solidarity with Palestine erupt all over the globe with 100,000 people in London and sizable demonstrations of tens of thousands in over 50 U.S. cities. Why, just six months after that, is that that U.S. Socialist Congress people played a role in increasing direct military aid to Israel, such that this year the U.S. has given the largest amount of direct aid, about $4.3 billion, to Israel. Um, the, more, the most is giving in a single year, probably in the past four decades. So why is it that after um, we're told that socialist politicians are winning the battle of hearts and minds and causing political earthquakes, um, and yet they have been inconsistent at best? So, you know, everyone's talking about Bowman, but Omar voted for the the 3.3 billion of direct military funding. Um, AOC abstained from the vote for I Iron Dome, um, and downright complicit in the case of Jamal Bowman in providing 
direct material support to the Israeli apartheid state. That contradiction of these two things, I think, is important for us in, in, in understanding what um, you know, may have gone wrong and how we can begin to talk about what we can do to build after Bowman. Um, and so why is it that then, you know, also when, when, when Bowman carried out the actions that he did, when he uh, broke the picket line, when he voted first for the $3.3 billion, uh, then for another billion for Iron Dome, had a photo op with the, you know, far right war criminal come Israeli prime minister, Israeli uh, Naftali Bennett. Why is it that when sections of the left began to rightfully call this out, um, like, like Haley laid out, that the, 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 the response for expulsion, um, you know, spread? Did sections of the socialist left swoop in to defend him? So why did sections of the socialist left come in to, to defend Bowman uh, in this, this, this point in time? I think answering this question requires us to come to terms to a weakness of a strategy of what I would call electoralism. I think it picks up some of the themes of what Haley talked about. And what I mean by that is the notion that social change comes primarily through winning of reforms by the slow accumulation of politicians who represent your idea or organization. This is primarily pursued within the Democratic Party. The methods of this are thus focused on getting the right people elected and maintaining connections and influence with these individuals. The consequence of this is that the prime actor is the politician who you uh, support and hope to influence. So Bowman in this example, that's the, that's the most important thing. That's the main actor in, in politics. He's your guy, he returns your calls, he meets with you. And by criticizing electoralism, the strategy that sees that as kind of the holy grail, I'm not saying that socialists should not engage in elections or have an electoral strategy, they should. However, when political considerations seem to be oriented on getting people into office as the endpoint of political strategy, and the workings in Congress is seen as the most important train of battle, we get into these situations where there's been a lot of concern spilled about damaging basically our access to Bowman. I don't even know who the hour is. Um, and the central d demand of BDS is being put forward and it, it tampers down be giving a full-throated defense of Palestine. That is rendered as secondary to, to defending the access to Bowman. The only reason that the response from our side has not been that of simple condemnation to Bowman is precisely because he's a member of DSA. I think that should be considering, uh, that should be concerning for all of us. So building a movement for Palestine against US imperialism is not gonna be done by holding back on these questions because the side that we oppose is not going to. I think this is precisely why the question of Palestine and US imperialism in our movements um, have to be seen really clearly. Um, and so some people uh, say that that criticizing Bowman is holding a politics of purity. It's saying, oh, we aren't asking people to agree with everything. Um, some people couch this as they saying, well, he's he's good on other things. He's good on the Green New Deal. And just that's just one issue among many. And I think, you know, no need to nitpick on this. Should we expel someone if they are against the unification of Ireland? I think those sort of points dramatically underestimate how central U.S. imperialism and strategic unquestioned support for Israel is for the U.S. ruling class. Um, it's the main thing that Biden put forward. We're going to put uh, restore the U.S. to the head of the table. And as of course we know, the U.S. being at the head of the world table is always bad for the people of the world. Um, the U.S. state works to secure its interests abroad in competition with other capitalist states. Um, and the Middle East uh, is still one of the central strategic areas because of its geoposition, geo its access to oil, finance circuits. And the U.S. is working to cement the Middle East into one economic zone that operates under the aegis of U.S. Influence. Uh, that's what is play with the U.S. Saudi Israel axis and competition with Iran and and by proxy Russia and China. And that's what's driven this normalization process that we've seen, in which uh, the Arab states have normalized their relationships with Israel. You know, they got planes flying back and forth, and economically the tie is made. And so imperialism is not a secondary issue for the U.S. capitalist class, but is a primary one. It's easy if you are in the bowels of the state or it's easier to be supportive of domestic priorities like the Green New Deal, but standing against US support for Israel and the question of imperialism is one that I think requires uh, a position of being firmer. So I think the question of it being about Palestine and how we're gonna build a movement that actually goes against this central priority of support for Israel and the, the maintenance of US imperial state abroad um, requires us to be firmer and not pivot as much. So it's not sort of a, a secondary issue, but it's one that we should see as central to the process of building a movement in the United States. And I would say one for the process of building a socialist movement. I think people think of socialism, they think of, you know, uh, better wages for, for, for people and the stuff that, that Bernie said and taxing the rich. And then we need to make sure that the question of imperialism is seen as one of the central things that we fight around. 
Um, and so uh, in talking about uh, what that means for, for, for moving forward, um, I think it's the question is how we can build a political movement that is clear on not um, going down the road of electoralism and finding the, 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 the politicians to get in the ones and twos, but how we can build a combative grassroots BDS movement that is strong enough and clear enough um, that can fight around BDS without mincing words, without going for the slow accumulation, but seeing that change happens quickly, that strange happens through through combativity. And this is not starting from, from nowhere. There's local campaigns scattered about. Um, you know, Groups like the Palestinian Youth Movement does important work. Groups like dissenters are doing work campaigning about U.S. Uh, militarism generally. And the DSA BDS working group, I think, is making some of these connections that Haley mentioned of connecting uh, movements uh, for justice in Palestine with that of socialism. I think that the sea change uh, that, that Haley described, that the more people being in solidarity with and support for Palestine, means that precisely now is the moment to fight harder and actually to hold these political lines clearer. And, and, and that is something that the moment requires. Um, and in doing so, the building of any campaign, of course, can be is slow low, arduous work to a certain degree, but we need to prepare to grasp the swift change of moments like the unity intifada. We need to see those as actually the prime motor of how change occurs, and not only as incidental to the slow process of, of gathering signatures or phone banking people, but that when people go into action, that's how our power is exerted, that is how consciousness changes, and that is how change has always occurred in, in, in the past for our side. I think alongside of how to energize a, a grassroots BDS movement, I think there's the question of key targets. I think in the last last round, uh, folks have focused on campuses, and I think we're revitalizing that as key, um, and on certain corporations. I think the Bowman Affair speaks to me of the need to, alongside of the important campaigns against the, the corporations that profit from uh, you, uh, Israeli apartheid, that the question of U.S. military support for Israel and its direct military aid, I think, should be more firmer on the table. I think us figuring out how to sort of connect up these threads of the, the small campaigns with the fact that if our role in the United States is to oppose the U.S. unquestioned and near blank check for Israeli apartheid, that us challenging at the heart, which is that direct military aid, is something that is key. Um, I think alongside of that is also the question of trade unions. We saw a flowering of, uh, of trade union uh, support for, for Palestinians during the, the, the bombing on Gaza in May, um, and several resolutions that were passed by trade unions um, that were in support of BDS. I think a, a resolution in solidarity is, a, is an excellent exertion of sympathy and can change, change minds, but how can we make sure that we also have campaigns um, for, for uh, divesting pensions and other things that the trade unions can engage in as well? And so I think there's a number of arraigns and terrains and, and avenues at which we can direct our movement. And I think that, you know, that the let, it, let it flower and let it go. But I think doing that in this moment after Bowman means I think being extra clear on the fact that the question of BDS is a picket line needs to be held, that sort of capitulation to the question of imperialism is going to be a devastating blow to the movement. And actually, we need to be sort of harder if we're going to sort of uh, build a movement against U.S. imperialism in the heart of the beast. And I think doing so knowing that we can't um, assume that Congress is ever going to be a positive terrain for us and that building a combative movement from, from without that can influence with our force of numbers and us holding to a demand um, and, and insisting upon that demand uh, is the only thing that will, that will win change and that can carry out the important um, work that we have in the U.S., which is opposing uh, our government support for you know, one of the most racist countries uh, in the world, which is that of Israel. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, now, last but not least, I'll turn it over to Rabab um, to finish our list of speakers. So go ahead, Rabab. Yes. Um, so can you hear me? Yes. OK. Uh, first of all, good evening. And secondly, I want to begin by acknowledging that my university, San Francisco State, sits on stolen, unceded indigenous people's land. And so is uh, I'm now on the East Coast, which is also part of the Lenape people. And I think this is one of the most important things to actually understand that when we talk about the United States, we are talking about settler colonial regime, just like the Israeli settler colonial regime. So when we want to understand why is it that U.S. politics the way it is, it goes back to how these states have been founded. What is the one they talk about shared values and about common values and so on? This is also part of it, that the problem with the United States did not really start 
on July 4th, 1776. And in fact, if we want to think about July 4th, 1776, we can also think in Palestine of May 15th, 1948, when Israel was founded. And it was also a settler colonial uh, uh, entity was fighting against colonialism. So we have settler colonialism and another new settlers that are actually fighting against them. So I think it's really important for us to keep that in mind. And I think this is part of the problem. Uh, maybe to understand, understanding Palestine and understanding the U.S. itself. What is it about the U.S. and where the four years, for example, of Trump? An aberration? Uh, an isolated incident? Or they were actually indicative and probably the most extreme ways of what the U.S. is about. That actually comes, brings about the whole question of uh, racism as perhaps thinking about it as, as racial capitalism, not just racism per se, and not just as capitalism per se, but actually the connection between the two, and thinking about how is it that they, it's unacceptable for people to actually take charge of their lives and exercise self-determination. So I think this is one of the issues that become really, really important to think about that. The other point that I would uh, want to emphasize is part of the reason why we're seeing all of this like viciousness against Palestine has to do, of course, with the uh, rising resistance and becoming more known to people in the U.S. So it's not like there hasn't been resistance. Palestinians have always resisted. And also it's really important to also acknowledge that the Zionist project has failed, has failed in Palestine. It is, it's nastier, it's more vicious, but that's also what happens when bullies uh, become attacked, they get nastier and they are going to scratch more and they are going to hit more. Because part of it is also the whole unacceptability for people to challenge power. So there is this issue that uh, 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 that the Zionists, the Zionists and their supporters, settler colonists, white supremacists, and so on. And I'm again, talking about it within the context of racial capitalism, not talking about it only in, the, in kind of separating racism from capitalism, imperialism, and so on, because all these phenomena come together and they connect. And it actually perhaps... Uh, Trump era was a very good time to actually see how the right wing was lined up. All the forces that were actually, I, get, I mean, if you think about Palestine being a barometer or row, it's not the only one, but how they align up, all of them kind of come together. Zionism has failed to erase Palestinians. Zionism has failed to get rid of genocide Palestinian people and so on. And the Zionist narrative itself has failed to convince people. So we're seeing more and more support. And the more and more support provokes uh, reaction. And the reaction comes on the part of people who have power, whether it is, you're talking about the imperialists, we're talking about the history of French colonialism in, in, in Algeria, we're talking about uh, Congo, we're talking about the whole history of the Americas, we're talking about uh, Palestine, you're talking about what's happening with people who are struggling here. Whenever there is more struggle and there is more determination, there is also nastiness, because power is not going to get brilliant it. Nobody gives away power unless they are forced uh, to, 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 to be, to, to take it away. So they are, and so we have this group, the Zionists, the pro-Zionist groups, the people who are hardcore, ideologically Zionist. And this is where I think it's really important to also think that there is, there are differences in a sense in the history, for example, of the movement to build solidarity with Palestine in the U.S. Uh, compared to the movement to build uh, solidarity with the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. And that has to do with the history of Zionism. It also has to do with the history of anti-Semitism. It has to do with the fact of Nazism and the Holocaust and the murder of uh, um, uh, six million Jews. And, and so this is, this is sort of, and then the simplicity of actually trying to understand what's going on and the power of the Zionist discourse to convince people that if you are actually supporting Palestine, you are contributing to anti-Semitism and you're going to contribute to another Holocaust. So this is, in this sense, it's really important to, to understand, even though historically, majority of Jewish intellectuals have always been anti-Zionist. If you read about there is much more in the history of it, but that's also a very big battle for the Zionist movement to continue to make it sound as if Judaism and Zionism and uh, Israel are one and the same. And in that sense, it becomes really, really, and, and this is where, for example, Jamal Bowman's position becomes problematic because Jamal thinks that if the Zionists are attacking him, he thinks about the, 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 the 
the Jews versus the Palestinians, rather than thinking about justice and injustice, that there are there are there are Jews who are extremely expanding number who are anti-Zionist historically have been from the, the 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 socialists and the communists and Marx and and the Bolsheviks and the Bonds and you know historically I mean there is so much history that we don't really have enough time to even go into it here and in Palestine and increasingly so. And uh, the whole so this is the simplistic equation that Palestine anti is 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 uh, is anti-Semitic and thus supporting Palestinians and supporting Palestinian liberation, not two states or whatever and so on will actually deliver the demise of the Jewish people, not the destruction of a settler colonial project in Palestine, which is Zionism, which is similar to the settler colonial project in the U.S., which is which uh, attempted to disgenocide the indigenous people, has engaged in slavery, the kidnapping and enslavement of African people, has engaged in exclusion, has engaged in all sorts of racism between against all communities of color, all people of the third world, women, uh, people who are working. I mean, the majority, let's say the 99 percent of the world, right? So the people don't see it that way. What they see it, they see it as this is this is Palestinians, and this is the way the Zionist movement tries to present, and this has been historically part of part of uh, part of the problem. So they are failing, and the fact that, for example, Amnesty International last week comes out with a report and said this is an apartheid state, the fact that uh, Human Rights Watch, the fact that the Israeli main quote unquote peace group B'Tselem, which came out of the Israeli Labour Party, comes out and says this is apartheid. And the fact that there is, of course, they are they are now joining Palestinian narratives talking again and again and again, but also part of racism and settler colonialism, not to listen to the people who are struggling on the ground, but always claim that they know what the recipes are. They know what's best for people. They know what the answers are. And I think it's really, it maybe behooves us to think about that this year, 2022, actually marks 40 years of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon and the Sabra and Shatila massacres. It's also 20th anniversary of the Jenin massacre and the Israeli re-invasion. And the reason I bring the two events together for several reasons. One is that it actually shows that Israel has in, been intent to destroy Palestinian and Palestinian resistance. And, live. and even after part of the Palestinian leadership compromised with the settler colonial project and entered in the Oslo Accord and legitimized the Zionist uh, colonialism of Palestine, even that was not sufficient. They con construct coup d'etats one way or the other. It has a but this goes way historically. But also the other reason that I'm mentioning national movement that was allied to it and basically re-legitimized uh, the Zionist project that this is nothing but a religious conflict when it was far from being at all a religious conflict. And the movement failed, movement failed then. And we see continuous episode coming again and again and again to actually re-speak uh, uh, about the same thing and present it as part of one is the whole exceptionalizing, exceptionalizing of Palestine, as if Palestine is separate from other struggles. Secondly, cons considering Palestine as a divisive issue and presenting it that if you really want to be for the common good of improvement in the country, if you want to really push social welfare or so on, it's okay to compromise on Palestine. It's okay to let the Palestinian issue go because it goes hand in hand with the Zionist project that actually wants to continue maintaining this and because more and more people are uh, supported. The other thing I think about and I think um, and I want to talk a little bit about the electoral politics and so on. I think it's really important to kind of like remember that the reason that there are progressive politicians in Congress is due to the fact of uh, changes on the ground. It's not the other way around. It's not because people are in Congress, they get elected and then they go lobby people and things have changed. Historically, the people who are in Congress actually come and lobby the constituency 
to enable them to participate in order to kind of stay in office. But the fact that there has been changes, and I think this is part of like if we talk about the Democratic Socialists of America, if we talk about the Bernie Sanders campaign, if we talk about a lot of things that have happened, things have changed. They're not where they should be, but things have changed in this country. But is that enough? Is that enough to make a change? And what is the goal? So I want to kind of like maybe, I, I think I have maybe two more minutes left, right, Ashley? So I think, yeah. So I think I want to tie in, we can, we can expand into all of it. What does this really mean? What is the connection between radical social transformation in the United States towards the whole question of uh, ending the, the control of the 1% over the 99%, enabling people just to be able to have health care, enabling people not to die because they could not, uh, they, 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 they had to work actually without, without even having mask and having protection and so on, because they have no other choice. The, the undocumented and so on. So how, what does this, how does this really connect with the question of Palestine? And is it really true that if you support the struggle for the Palestinian people, for self-determination, for liberation, for freedom, is that going to undermine the struggle? And I would just say, I mean, from our history, from this going on historically again and again, this has proven to be actually not, not a non-starter, whether you're thinking about the whole opposition to the Vietnam War and the opposition to the imperialist intervention in Vietnam. You're thinking about the, the radical forces in the U.S., whether you talk about the Black Panthers, the American Indian Movement, the Young Lords, the, 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 the Chicano Movement, and so on and so forth, how they were connected very much with the struggle of people here and what is it that advanced and actually we're seeing more renditions of what's going on today the last point that i wanted to talk about is the whole question in which the racism plays a very big role in arguing that people who are people of color people who are progressive people who are representing marginalized communities and so on are constructed by the zionist discourse are unable and non-qualified to speak about palestine so constantly, for example, so somebody like Jamal Bournemouth would be said, you really don't know. We're going to come and teach you because you're not an expert. You're not part of the foreign policy establishment. You don't really know what to do. And it's also not your place to speak because why don't you pay attention to your own bread and butter issues? And this is something that actually has come up the U.S. Social Forum in 2010 when the, the, the leadership of the U.S. Social Forum invited a Zionist group to have a, uh, a workshop on uh, queer uh, gay movements in the Middle East because people were so seduced by actually accepting the Islamophobic Orientalist notion that Arabs, Muslims, and Palestinians are extremely, excessively homophobic, excessively sexist. And so it's really important to have a group that pr brings about the, the speaking about the gay rights and feminist rights and so on. And I'm not kind of like people know what I'm talking about, the pink wash and so on, but it actually brings it to the, and exceptionalizes Palestine, exceptionalizes Arabs, exceptionalizes Muslims, so the, the connection between imperialism, between uh, Zionism, between settler colonialism, between racism come together. So it's not only about how people come together. I mean, I think uh, uh, to think about why is it that there is black Palestinian solidarity, why there is solidarity between people who are fighting against the border and so on. It's a byproduct of the people seeing the parallels against settler colonialism and understanding how the systemic world and rejecting, refusing to actually separate between quote unquote what's domestic and what's foreign. And thinking about, and probably this is my last point, I mean, I have so much more to say, but thinking about how can we connect uh, the, the various struggles? How can we struggle on various fronts, number one? How can we think about the multiple ways? What are the tasks for the U.S. movement for radical trans transformation? And what are the tasks for the solidarity movement? They're not one and the same. There, there is very big differences between the two. Of course, solidarity is supposed to be reflective like the solidarities of the workers in the 18th century and so on. That's not what it's being said today. But there are different tasks about it. But however the tasks we're thinking about, it's really, really important to connect that we're talking about justice that if we think that we're going to advance justice for workers and say that it is cause against justice for the Palestinians, we're actually losing. And this is the same struggle that we're ha those of us who've been working in the Palestine movement, I don't know for how long, forever and ever, have always been saying that it is not only about people in Ferguson are saying we support Palestine, so we have to support them. It's not about transactional solidarity. It's really about struggles that are uh, coming up in different parts of the world. And there is when there is when Vietnam wins, 
it is a struggle for Palestinians. That's why, by the way, the Palestinian literature leftists has so much stuff about the, uh, about Vietnam. When the Algerians win, of course, it becomes really, really important. When people in Standing Rock or Mauna Kea, when it is really, really important, when the workers read for ed, when when the teachers, when the work, when people are struggling and actually making accomplishments, this is also uh, accomplishments for Palestine. So if we think about it as uh, a question of actually connected, dialectical, interrelated, linked with each other, and actually go and challenge and hold people accountable and say, you can say this is okay. It's not, you cannot actually argue, and maybe on a humorous level, that Palestinian life is less important than other lives. That's the basic thing of it. But you can't actually really believe that things will change if you think you can just have a bent and solutions here and there. You may want to do, and I'm not against, reformist politics. I'm I'm fine. We can do that. And I voted for Jamal Bowman. I changed even from uh, from independent to Democrat for the primary to go vote for him. I've been I've been, you know, advocating for him. So I don't have a I don't have a problem for it. It's not for me the ideal solution. I think there is needs to be real social change. But however you think about it, you can't accomplish it if you think that the crux of the matter can only take one band a solution here or there, or placate Zionists or imperialists, or think that we can compromise on one issue because it's the common good for the other issues, i.e. a liberal utilitarian argument. You, we really have to advocate and understand and live the indivisibility of justice day in and day out. And I will stop at that. Thank you so much, Rabab. That was brilliant and stirring. Thank you for those powerful words. Um, I just have a few questions um, for the panel before we start fielding questions from the audience for the panel. I, I really want to encourage people to ask questions of all sorts. If you want simple explanations of concepts and issues that you're not familiar with, feel free to put those in the chat, as well as challenging political questions. So we welcome all the questions, put them in the chat, and we'll pose as many as we possibly can to, to our wonderful panelists this evening. I just had a, a few questions um, for each of you um, to, to get the ball rolling. Uh, I wanted to start with a question um, for you, Brian, because uh, Rabab mentioned it, but I think the development of these human rights organizations writing stunning exposés and reports calling Israel an apartheid state is really a reflection of this mass struggle that started obviously in Palestine and has spread through solidarity initiatives throughout the world. And it's beginning to change the international political discourse about Palestine. And I'm really curious what you think the impact and also the responses by the establishment and by the Zionists and by the state of Israel to this exposure of Israeli apartheid. What's the significance of it and how can we use that to advance the struggle? Um. Thanks, Ashley. Good question. Thanks, for Bob, for, for your wonderful thoughts and commentary. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, I mean, many of the, the reports, so the Betselem uh, report came out actually before the Unity Intifada. And so um, I think that, you know, amnesty probably was propelled by that, but the Unity Intifada was one flashpoint in, I think, um, organizing and, and that has been going on for, for quite a long time. And I think it is one of the more prominent um, manifestations of the sea change that Haley mentioned, of just um, you know the the movements on the ground. Um, I think uh, cast lead is when a lot of this I think really sort of set off, in which you had a brutal, brutal bombardment of Gaza um, that occurred with the medium of the internet, and so there were people were able to directly see the the bloodthirsty crimes of. Uh, of Israel. Um, and you saw uh, kind of around that time is when SJP started kicking off on campus. And I think that there's been a radicalization and a polarization um, around that time. Um, I think it's notable and connected that, you know, 2008 is also when the capitalist system went into a, a serious crisis that it has not recovered. And so I think there's been a general radicalization on um, polarization around the fact that, hey, maybe this society doesn't work for, for, for most people. And that's expressed through everything through Occupy, through the Black Lives Matter explosion, um, through the question of Palestine, which I think, of course, is, is a very important thing for both um, 
for, for Americans to sort of consider. Um, we saw this uh, kind of progress more. I think the Sanders is one effect of it. Um, 2019 was a year of global revolt um, in which, you know, there were massive demonstrations against, um, you know, for democracy, against you know, liberalism, against sort of all types of things that, you know, deposed the government in Sudan and Algeria. And so there's, there's I think, a, a molecular radicalization around the system itself that has been ongoing since 2008. And I think Palestine, because of I think a lot of it is a testament to the the courageous steadfastness of the Palestinian people, and it's a you know there's a lot of of causes of of, of colonial movements and uh, uh, that that don't have the same recognition as Palestine. And that's a testament to to, to Palestinian organizers. Um, it is in many ways I think a symbol of of international solidarity. Like you go to you know any demonstration for any cause, and you always see a Palestinian flag because the, it's known that you know Palestinians by themselves are not going to be able to sort of free themselves entirely. And so the question of solidarity is one that I think is speaks really for Israel because more and more I think the question of, you know, progressive except for Palestine is is sort of uh, burned away in in the 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 literature and the the catalogs of the the ongoing crimes and racism of the, the Israeli state. Um, and so I think that is the possibility of just more activity on our side. I think that, you know, it's much easier now when I can say, hey, Amnesty International says it's apartheid than like five years ago, which I was arguing with apartheid. People would just see me as some like crazy leftist or something like that. And so I think it's just part of the sea change that I think is both um, a, a product of the movements and also the potentiality for us to push further. I think that's an important thing, too, to keep going. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll wrap with, with, I think, one thing that is, is is riffing off of one of the things that Rabab said, which is the question of Zionism. And so I think that seeing it as not just a human rights issue, which some liberals see, but as a question of decolonization um, as, as the goal is so important. Um, and that's something that can be pushed on. We're like, you know, when the bombardment was come, it was what was going in Gaza this past May, you know, various progressives tweeted about how they opposed the bombing. And that's great. Um, Sanders penned an op-ed in the New York Times that, you know, was was fairly good. But he saw it as a, uh, a consequence of Netanyahu, of the leadership, uh, and not 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 the, the Zionist regime. I think one of the things in the unit in Infada that is so uh, profound and inspiring is the way in which it wasn't just against the occupation, but was against settler colonialism all across historic Palestine. Um, and that lesson, I think, is one that we need to bring back here and see it as not as just human rights, but against decolonization. And so that's why when Jamal Bowman um, goes on this junket with J Street, who one of their main campaigns is to to revitalize the, the two state solution as though it were like, you know, a weekend at Bernie's corpse that are going to sort of chart around, um, that we see that, that, that the two state solution and, and those sorts of, uh, of consequences actually prolong uh, Zionism and the settler colonial uh, system, as opposed to saying, hey, it's not just about human rights per se, but it's about liberation, it's about decolonization, and it's about the end of apartheid. Thanks so much, Brian. Um, now I had a question for Haley, because I was really struck listening to Rabab talk about the inseparability of all the struggles against racism, oppressions of all sorts, and exploitation of working class people. That These are all linked together. One of the most important developments over the last several years has been the recovery of this Black Palestine solidarity tradition. And it's one of the things that I found most disturbing about the Bowman affair is that it was a setback and a challenge to that solidarity between these two liberation struggles. And I just want you to talk a little bit about this, the some of that history, how Bowman's betrayal impacts it, and the response of black activists um, who have in increasing numbers recognized the common struggle of black liberation and Palestinian liberation. Sure. Um, and uh, thanks to the other speakers. Uh, this is such a great event. <laughs> I'm excited that I'm here. Um, I. I agree totally that it was such a setback. And one of the most cynical things that happened around um, the Bowman affair was people kind of pointing to DSA and saying, this is a white organization attacking this black person, um, you know, who's a person, you know, uh, in Congress. Um, just incredibly cynical things like this um, were levied to get around the fact that 
first of all, this was a call that came from Palestinian and black and um, all kinds of people in solidarity with Palestine, including the Afro-Socialist Caucus and the Muslim Caucus, right? Um, so undermining their voices within this um, was one of the results of that. The other thing is they're calling out racism. Like it's pure and simple. It's pretty silly to um, accuse them of racism for trying to get Bowman to actually um, be held accountable for a crime of apartheid um, for uh, funding that um, by funding Israel um, and by trying to stand in solidarity against racism against Palestinians. So that was just an incredibly cynical argument um, and I think shows, you know, um, the reality that, you know, anybody, unfortunately, um, can do these things. In other words, it's not about the um, individual enforcing them. It's about what they do. Um, we heard, you know, arguments from prominent, um, you know, Palestinian voices in the U.S. who are part of different think tanks and NGOs um, trying to prevent Bowman from getting expelled and sort of using their own identities actually in the service of shutting down BDS activism by grassroots Palestinians, right? Um, it's no different really to me than what we see very often where um, Black politicians end up uh, shutting down calls to defund the police um, by grassroots Black activists. So there's also a similarity, I think, in the universalism, um, the, the arguments for universalist politics that Rabab was talking about. What I mean is when you say, well, um, let's not focus on this one issue. Let's focus on the bread and butter. Let's focus on the things that actually affect everybody. This is kind of a secondary issue or a distraction. And I think that that misses um, in both cases, the centrality of Palestinian struggle to the entire region, to the entire um, apparatus of U.S. imperialism, right, um, or of black struggle to um, undermining the divisions that the ruling class has been able to voice since the very beginning of this country um, within the working class. So. Uh, seeing these things as secondary, um, aside from the fact that you're basically saying we're not going to measure our movement by the people who are directly under attack at this moment, um, whether we're able to uphold them and saying we're going to see this as secondary, it's also a false um, compromise that you're making there. I think about the fact that people often pointed to Jamal Bowman's stance on the Green New Deal as a reason not to support um, uh, or as a reason not to expel him because he supported the Green New Deal. Um, the irony there to me is when you think about the greenwashing that Israel engages in or the ways that Israel tries to detract from its um, uh, violations against Palestinian humanity um, um, and its brutality uh, by saying, well, we have, you know, we're, we're so good on the environment. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like that sort of thing. It's the same sort of compromise, um, which is really not um, a legitimate compromise to make. It actually weakens our movement by leaving someone out. Um, and I think that uh, just to go to the history, I'm going to give a brief anecdote, um, which I actually got from Angela Davis around 2015. I went to this really interesting conference on the black radical tradition um, where, by the way, almost every single person there, the entire audience was almost all black and everyone was wearing um, keffiyehs. I think half the audience was wearing keffiyehs. Um, so that shows that uh, uh, the parallels people were making even back then. But the anecdote she gave was actually about George Jackson um, and how um, George Jackson for a very long time had this poem attributed to him called Enemy of the Sun. Um, and uh, it's because he had it in prison. And it turned out that this poem was actually not written by George Jackson, but by a Palestinian activist. And when you read the poem, I encourage people to look it up. It's such a powerful poem, again, Enemy of the Sun. Um, you can see how someone would think that that was about struggle in the US when in fact it was about struggle in Palestine because there are these deep interconnections between them. So going back to the Black Panthers and SNCC, um, going um, back to the anti-apartheid struggle, um, the fact that South Africa has been so, you know, that has had such a strong movement in solidarity with Palestine is no coincidence. It's because of all of these deep interconnections. And, you know, as Rob said, it's like when someone 
is going into struggle against the brutality and racism of their own country. The fact that this country is then also helping to enforce brutality and racism somewhere else, there's no way you can struggle against that here without then also having to reckon with and deal with the parallels and also the direct connections between the struggles in other parts of the world. And so I think that's why this has resonated so strongly and you know why we have to stand up to people like Bowman in particular when they do, because it's actually that much more egregious to have the face of a black socialist being someone who's willing to put Palestine solidarity on the back burner. Thanks so much, Haley. Rabab, I wanted to, to turn to a question for you. And before I do, I just w- really want to encourage people in the who are in on the audience in the audience to pop your questions in. We're getting a few questions, but more the more questions, the merrier. And don't feel uh, don't be afraid to ask questions for explanation, etc. Um, so, Rabab, I was really struck by what you said about Zionism failing, and that when a bully is challenged they get nastier. And I think that's true, obviously, of Israel, but it's also true of the political establishment here in the United States and their relationship to the state of Israel. Because I, if you look at the criminalization that's going on of BDS, banning the right to boycott, divestment, and sanctions in states and cities across the country, can you talk a little bit about what that means and how the Palestinian movement and the Palestinian solidarity movement should respond to that attack and how Bowman fits in as part of that backlash and attempt to push back this advance that we're starting to make. Well, let me start with Jamal. Jamal knows better. He knows. He knows. He knows. We've been in many discussions with him. He knows. He knows what's going on, and I think he's really mistaken if he thinks that actually him taking this position in uh, um, to ameliorate Zionism and ameliorate the Zionist project and actually vote for machines that kill people, kill people, uh, that's going to make it make him more uh, attractive. It's not, it won't, because what, who voted for Jamal Bowman were people on the grassroots. The people who are actually very struggling against him very strongly are a bunch of Zionists in Riverdale who are connected with settlements. I mean, this is a, they will never, they will never, ever vote for him, no matter how many times he wants to remake himself. It won't work. They won't. They won't. They're, they're, they're a bunch of racists, white supremacists. The racist against uh, 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 Jews who of color. The racist against Ethiopian Jews. They're against uh, the racist against Jews from Arab and Muslim countries. I mean, this is who they are. They they are connected with settlements. You're not even talking. You're no more. You're not talking about uh, quote unquote soft Zionists. You're actually talking about people who are rabid. That there is no way, no way, that they will vote for a black man. Okay, this is. I mean, this is where. Jamal knows better. They keeps, he keeps talking about being pressured. And we said, by whom? You have half of your constituents, the people who voted for you, a, uh, AOC supported you. People who voted for you were majority of people of color. People who were excited at the, specifically during the Black Lives Uprisings. I mean, this is, this, is, this, is what, this is how it was possible for Jamal to defeat Elliot Engel and take his position in the primaries. And Elliot Engel is known, A, quote unquote, to be sort of liberal, right, on all issues except for Palestine, and a rabid Zionist. So the people who voted for you know what you stand for. They know that we want to have education for our kids. We, we know we want to have the police stop killing, I mean, defund the police altogether, abolition, but in the meantime, also stop killing uh, black and, and brown kids and so on. He knows better. And he also knows better that the whole this whole project of uh, um, J Street or the so-called two-state solution. I mean, everybody knows, even the people who are advocating, it doesn't work because what is there left to actually have a state? If you want to talk about geographical state and so on and so forth, and you want to talk about the sort of the classical form of sovereignty and so on, there's nothing left. It, it, it's not, it doesn't mean, I'm, I'm saying it doesn't mean that we say, oh, okay, it's all apartheid state, so we, we should actually have a civil uh, you know, society struggle or whatever, and so on in Palestine. No, but what I'm saying is that he knows, he knows better. 
So now the whole question of what happened is, and, and you both spoke about the May, uh, May uh, uh, uprisings, the May struggle against uh, um, Israeli colonialism and so on. I think what really what was very, very interesting to watch is that there was so much space opening up. And because so much space was opening up, the Zionists had to come in and strike with such brutal, I mean, in, to, in, to the point of lying, that the people who are protesting were anti-Jewish. Of course, again, calling the Jews who are protesting and supporting Palestine self-hating. I mean, this is the same stories. And the problem is that, I mean, okay, sometimes I think about, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. Sometimes I think just bring us something a little bit more interesting. It's just so boring. You keep coming with the same old stuff again and again and again. But it's actually quite dangerous because they are, this is not allowed. It is not allowed. They are not going to allow it. And I think the whole question of even talking about Amnesty International. Amnesty International, I remember back in the 80s, trying to get Amnesty. They, were, they support Palestinian prisoners. But they refused to support any prisoners who are actually like engaged in armed struggle or fighting Israel or whatever. Now Amnesty International actually calling Israel an apartheid state. And if we think about how the struggle around the prisoners in South Africa not only Mandela, but all the prisoners and so on, all the prisons, was actually developed as well. Because also at some point, everybody was called terrorists, from Mandela, Oscar Robles Rivera, everybody was called the terrorists and so on. I mean, until, until uh, uh, South Africa acknowledged at least political defeat, South African apartheid regime, everybody was called the terrorists and everybody was banned from coming to the US and excluded and so on. Again, this is really important to have a historical perspective on things. So this is this is a shift. There is a very big shift that's moving on in the imaginary, in the political imaginary, as well as on the ground. And the Zionists are really freaking out because more and more and more people are actually recognizing, even if you want to talk about very liberal human rights, humanity, the humanity of the Palestinians, that for the New York Times, which is a very big Zionist paper, to actually publish the pictures of Palestinian children who were killed in Gaza, it must have been such a huge pressure for them to actually acquiesce to put something like this, because we know what the New York Times is about. They publish one, one tenth of an article in support of Palestinians, hundred others in support of Israel, again and again and again, including this zoo that's going on, this amusement park. I mean, it's all these even, I mean, they also, by the way, during the whole Black Lives uh, uh, um, uh, uprising and so on, they actually wrote a very big article saying that violence by people carrying guns in the street in the U.S. is different than what was going on in Israel. It's like, why is that different? Why is it okay for the settlers to be slinging around machine guns and going around? I, 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 I kid you not, there was a very big article theorizing that Israeli settler violence is exceptionally different than U.S. white supremacist violence. I mean, this is, it was in order to continue because it is because it is the paper that actually tried to engage in the developing an intellectual discourse to convince people so for them for the zionists it's take no prisoners it's really take no prisoners at one point i think maybe some people um, different age things and so on but i do remember at some point we were always told oh let's just have a dialogue let's just sit down and have a dialogue and that became in the 1987 Intifada, a very big deal. Now, actually, this doesn't work. No, no dialogue, complete silencing, complete criminalization. I mean, criminalizing human rights organizations that are actually fighting, like people who co-defend prisoners in Israeli courts, but lawyers, criminalizing, criminalizing us because we want to teach. And we, and you know, the U.S. law is actually very, very, very broad and very uh, loose in order to criminalize anybody who might be seen as supporting anything that might be considered illegal. I mean, they've tried against me and my colleague last year, calling that we are providing material support for terrorism and so on and so forth. They, the, the, the thing is, is that they, these, even these, even the laws that are very, very, they don't work. They don't work, but they try to do that because the propaganda war is very, very important. And I want to go and remind us also that when Israel was founded, one of the most important tasks was the PR issue. The Ministry of Security was uh, was assigned. The Mossad, the the the, the Shane Bet, they were all assigned. The task of security equals the task of PR. It's very very important because if Israel loses, 
the public relations, what is there? I mean, this is the whole thing. The whole thing about Israel, why is there is redeeming qualities that people think about that is that this is the place that is providing safe haven for the Jews. And if you destroy Israel, you're actually going to create another Holocaust. As simple as that. This is this is the equation. So when people actually think of Israel as actually not being a safe haven for the Jews, but in fact, it's actually a racist uh, production against the Palestinians. And Israel was said, why didn't you use water cannon against Palestinians who are protesting? Why are you shooting and breaking the They said, we send them to South Africa. We don't have any more left. I mean, this stuff, there were articles in the Jerusalem, even Jerusalem Post in English language, Israeli, supporting apartheid and saying this is the right way to do it. So I think it's really important to keep remembering that this is what Israel, Israel is a material, has the highest tech security industries, the weaponization, securitization industry, the scandal of the NSO that was spying on the on the on the on the families of the of the Mexican children who were the 40 who are still missing, human rights organizations, the the the, the people who were friends with Jamal Khashoggi in Saudi I mean like again and again to the point that the US government itself has to declare NSO that it's illegal. I mean imagine what would it for the US government to actually declare that it's terrible. So, I mean, there is all of this stuff is very is part of a political economy. It's very materialist. It's materialist. It's ideological. There is a whole project in, involved. And the fact that the Palestinians that are actually have nothing to lose but their chains are standing up and saying, I'm not going to go. I'm not moving from Sheikh Jarrah. I'm not leaving Lid. I'm not going to do. I'm going to continue organizing day in and day out. And I think also it's really I just want to mention here is that Along with the Palestinians who were arrested during the Lud, uh, you know, uh, racial hatred things and so on, there were also a lot of Israeli Jews who were arrested. That also the New York Times and other papers are not interested in covering, because once you do that, you deepen the equation. Yeah, that, that you deepen the division, and you show that actually you can't keep saying that this is Jewish, that Palestinians are against Jews that this is protective of the Jews. Actually, there is a serious problem with that. So I think, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I took a little bit longer, but uh, I thought this, anyway, so I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> you were great, Rabab. Thank you so much for those comments. That was incredibly powerful. I have one quick question for Brian and then one final roundup question for the whole panel that each of you can take a couple of minutes to respond to. Um, and I'll do it in reverse order when we get to that. So, Brian, there's a question that came in from the audience about how can we respond to those defending Iron Dome who say that it is for defense, not attack, and protects everyone in Israel, including Palestinians? How should how should the solidarity remove movement respond to that? Yeah, I think there's an easy answer. I mean, Iron Dome was developed um, in the wake of the Second Lebanon War in 2006. Um, and during that war, Israel uh, carried out uh, collective punishment on Lebanese population, killed thousands of people, um, you know, drew war crimes alle allegations from Human Rights Watch and Amnesty for dropping cluster bombs and white phosphorus. Um, and the, the pretext for that was a Hezbollah raid into Israeli con controlled territory. Um, and then I think the second thing that led to Iron Dome was of course the blockade of Gaza. So the illegal um, blockade of Gaza that has made Gaza an open air prison. Um, and so Iron Dome allows for those things in which it allows for the complete flagrant bombardment of civilian populations with you know, no possible cost of, of human life for Israelis. And so it, it provides the cover for just like the indiscriminate air attacks that you see. 
And so the notion that it's defensive is absurd because it doesn't occur in the void. It occurs in the context of, <laughs> and it doesn't even work, um, it occurs in, in the context of uh, overwhelming sort of ability to bombard Gaza and 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 Israel's neighbors. Um, and I think this dovetails with what Babu was saying is too, they're also exporting it. So through the normalization uh, deals that they are exporting Iron Dome, I think Morocco is the first to sort of hop on board. And so they, they also, and as they do with all of the security technologies, they test it on Palestinians and then sell it to, to other states in the uh, uh, sort of a, uh, barbaric product testing sort of thing. So yeah, I think that's the quick and easy answer. It allows for the indiscriminate uh, bombing of civilian populations. Thanks so much, Brian. And well, this is the wrap up question for everybody. And we'll start with Rabab, then Brian and Haley, you can wrap us up and I'll just have a couple of concluding remarks. Um, so we got a question that came in from the audience that read this way. It seems many new socialists in and around DSA don't have a direct experience of building BDS on their campuses and in their neighborhoods since it's faded as a tactic. How do you think we can use this Bowman affair to propel the grassroots activist strategy that won over so many millions in the recent past to Palestine solidarity? So we'll begin with you, Rabab. I'm going to pass. Maybe I'll come back and talk about it. Okay. We'll let Brian and then Haley go specific. and then, and then Rabab. And I think that it's getting at how can we get use this attack to rebuild and reinvigorate the struggle inside the United States? What kind of coalitions, initiatives, joint projects, targets, et cetera? So we'll let Brian, then we'll do Haley, and then Rabab, you'll have the last word. So go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I'll be brief. I think one of the, the um, most positive things about BDS is that it's a very handy tool to do activism wherever you are. And it's very easy because there's so much in the United States that is complicit with Israeli apartheid. And so finding a target, be it some, you know, corporate target or the pension fund that your you know, union works for or, you know, all the politicians who voted for this with the exception of like six. And so like the, the ability to find a target to do activism around and then to use that activism to talk to people about the question of Palestine is really of such an easy, accessible magnitude. And so I think that is the, 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 the easy answer for that. Um, I think it's human rights framework makes it easily translatable to, to sort of liberals and people around it, whereas, you know, it's not, it doesn't call out for a specific solution um, to, to, to uh, liberation for Palestine, but, you know, for the, the, the main demands of, of BDS. Um, and that equal rights framework, I think, is, is something that's also easily translatable um, for folks. Um, I think the last thing, uh, to own that is I think, yeah, we can take it up wherever you are in your trade union, in your school, in your workplace. But I think that the challenge, too, is how to have a flowering of campaigns. But I think that also the, the movement um, nationally, and I think some of the coalescing and, and discussions around the DSA BDS working group with other national formations is the the possibility to have some sort of national campaign, which is something that hasn't really come about in the same way. And I think that, you know, it shouldn't be something that's counterposed with the local, but I think that's something that really could see as a coalescence um, uh, uh, of stuff. And as I mentioned in, in my, um, my previous uh, comments, I really think that part of that would be also focusing on the, um, the USA to Israel. Um, I think that the stuff like SodaStream is easy, uh, you know, the, the pensions, but to really sort of go at I think the most egregious connection with the country that that we inhabit um, and the 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 um, the oppression of Palestinians is that of direct military aid to Israel. And so I think that you know take up campaigns where you are. The easy of of BDS is so it's readily applicable. But I think the beginning to think about national campaigns and really focusing on direct military aid, I think, is one key target to work on in the 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 mid to long term. Thanks so much, Brian. Go ahead, Haley. Yeah, I agree with that, Brian. I was just thinking, you know, um, 
that, that that was a question that occurred to me was whether people who have come around this movement more recently were aware or were involved in the kind of BDS activism that kind of laid the groundwork for what we're seeing today. Um, and, you know, I I think that it's probably a mixed bag, but obviously it would be really great to have a revitalized BDS toolkit that we could, you know, use where we are to educate people with and um, develop different tactics and, you know, conferences and things to share strategies and things that have worked. Uh, there's also a lot going on in countries. I know that there's like been um, targeting of of the company Elbit Systems in the UK and it is really drone factory and the activists who were involved in that targeting um, ended up being um, arrested but then acquitted um, because of the mass support. So um, I think there's creative things we can do. I remember there were like more local campaigns that, you know, notwithstanding what Ryan said, that largely we want to end up having a movement that's big enough and you know, able to actually raise its heights, uh, its sights not only on the boycott side and then getting the supermarkets eventually to shut down um, the selling of cyber hummus. Um, but, you know, that's a smaller scale action. It does educate people. It does get more people involved. Um, it allows you to build up to the bigger types of actions. But the other thing I just wanted to mention is that um, it's almost Israeli apartheid week, which is going to be next month. And so I think that would be yet another moment to not let this die down, but to figure out how do we actually organize with more people um, than we previously were. Because as we've been saying throughout this call, there's been a sea change. There is a moment that I think, um, you know, gives us a good challenge, which is not how do we convince Bowman so much or how do we convince these politicians, but how do we organize the people who are actually hungry to get involved in this? Okay, I, I, I thought about it. Sorry. Yes, go ahead, Rabat. You know, so, so, so we talk about it all the time. So I want to say a couple of things. One is that how do you express solidarity with the, with the people? You uh, you respond to their demand. And the BDS, Boycott Divestment Session, is, is a demand by the Palestinian civil society. I think also is that it focuses on institutional, not individuals. I mean, with, when you're talking about, uh, we're talking about institutions, repressive institutions. It holds Israel accountable to the same standards as all other countries. So when they say singling out Israel, actually doesn't work. And if you think about, I mean, the whole advocacy for BDS and the ways in which uh, they try to criminalize it has counter uh, has has counterbalance. So now we have ACLU and other organizations that historically would not necessarily have spoken up. They actually are supporting uh, Palestine. And I think also if we think about what happened with South Africa, in the sense that we did not really in 1985, 86, 94, and so on. It's not that there was complete divestment going on, but the normalization of apartheid became a very bad thing. Yeah. And this is what Israel is really worried about. It's worried, and that's why they, they consider it as existential threat. So actually, for people, I mean, this is the same thing. Think about the Jim Crow South and kids sitting on the lunch counters or trying to go to school and something and being beaten, be, being beaten up and, and killed by these white races because they did not relinquish power. I mean, think about that. And I think the parallels, it makes it very easy for, for people to say, look, at the very least, I'm not going to participate in further repression. I am not going to normalize, make normal a situation that is not normal, that's problematic. And I think this is the basic thing that people can do. Just don't, don't cross the picket line. Do not participate in furthering injustice. At the very least, even if you can't take out your camera and take a picture of the cops killing, up, killing a kid or beating up a kid or something, at the very least, you stand witness. You refuse to participate, and this is part of it, is that you refuse to participate. And I think it's a very powerful tool in the sense that it is, and this is why, why designers actually have a problem with this. So I think there are ways to, to, to build upon it and, and expand it, and it is expanding. We are winning, so. Thank you so much, Rabab. I just want to thank um, all the speakers, Rabab, Haley, and Brian. You spoke very powerfully. I hope everybody shares 
the YouTube video of this and more and more people watch it and get involved in both the discussion of what happened with Bowman, how we can build a stronger movement coming out of it and win, like Rabab was talking about. I want to thank the Haymarket team who do incredible work behind the scenes and are all too often forgotten in the list of thank yous. I won't name them because there's a legion of people behind the scenes making all of this um, possible. And Finally, I want to just remind people to take advantage of Spe Spectre's special discount offer in the run-up to Valentine's Day, where you can get 25% off a subscription on the print journal. And be sure to check out the website where we're going to be increasing our coverage, coverage of the Palestinian solidarity uh, uh, struggle and the Palestinian liberation struggle, because it's all one part of an international movement for our collective liberation. And I just want to end with the kind of stirring words that Rabab gave us about the interconnectedness of all the struggles all around the globe. And this kind of common struggle is what will win a better society for all of us. Thank you so much for joining us this evening.